and the bighorns move up the mountain to feed on the fresh grasses. Their thick winter coats will soon molt, but then grow again at the end of summer, ready for the next big freeze. Having raised their metabolic rate once again, the marmots are out and about. They lick the rocks for the minerals left behind by the receding snows. But these are not the fat creatures of last summer, they're streamlined versions. They've lost about a third of their body weight over the winter. And they don't have long in which to mate and then put on weight again, ready for the next hibernation. With plenty of predators, sleeping for a duck can be perilous. But they have the remarkable ability of allowing half their brain to sleep while keeping the other half awake. One eye closed, the other open, always looking for danger. Finally, the milk cart that came to the rescue. It's evening, and William Seal is arriving in the small English village of Maddingley on his electric milk float. But there's not a milk bottle or cream carton in sight. In fact, he's got some curious bits of equipment and some even stranger road signs, which he puts in place and then waits for the sun to set. Between February and April, Darkness here signals the end of one phase of life and the beginning of another. After six months hibernating in old tree stumps or rodent burrows, the Maddingly toads have awakened with an irrepressible urge to mate. This takes place in water. They seem to like the pond where they were born and they faithfully return to it over and over again. They've been coming to this pond in Manningley for as long as anyone can remember. There was never any problem until their migration route was intersected by a modern road. The peak time for toad crossings is just after dark, and this coincides with the local rush hour. Something had to be done. And this is where William and a group of volunteers come riding to the rescue on the milk float. A fine mesh fence is placed along the verge. Its lower edge is buried into the ground and forms a barrier to the amorous travellers. If the temperature is above six degrees Celsius and it's reasonably damp, then you can bet that the volunteers, known as the Maddingley Toad Rescue, will be out and about. Armed with a torch powered by a car battery, they pick up any toads found behind the fence and put them in their buckets. Meanwhile, some of the volunteers are on their bicycles, patrolling for toads beyond the area covered by the fences. This goes on all evening, until the migration tapers off around midnight. Once they've filled their buckets, the rescuers place their load of toads into a larger collection bin. The timing is most unfortunate. As it gets later, and fewer and fewer toads attempt the dangerous crossing, so there's less and less traffic. By midnight, most of the volunteers have gone home, and William begins the job of counting the night's horn. One, two, three. He sexes them, and knows by the bucket they're in which toads were arriving at the lake and which were on their way back. When he's sure he's got the toads that were heading towards the pond, William makes his way there. 
Some toads will migrate four kilometers to get to water. And this is the moment the males have been journeying towards. Once in the pond, they grasp onto the back of the nearest female and stay there until she's laid her eggs. But with the males outnumbering females by five to one, this can sometimes mean a female will suffocate under the weight of all her suitors. About midsummer, a new generation of toads, smaller than a thumbnail, will emerge. Then, thanks to Maddingly Toad Rescue, they'll set off to find a place for their own winter hibernation.